Hello, I'm Agnes Kunkel, your host in 2023, your window to the world beyond COVID-19. We have now 31,365,000 confirmed cases worldwide and over 965,000 people have been confirmed to have died. Today we have 22nd of September 2020. Our guest today is Paul Comfort speaking on public transportation in 2023. Paul Comfort is an expert on leadership, transportation infrastructure and transit trends. As former CEO of Maryland Transit Administration, he most recently led a revolutionary change from a 50-year-old old-school transit system to the world-class Baltimore Link, an efficient, high-frequency, connected rail and bus transit system in Baltimore, Maryland. Mr. Comfort has spent a career in public transport and local government, having served as a county administrator for two suburban counties in Maryland and was elected as a county commissioner. He also worked in business development and operations management for many public and private transit operations. He is currently Vice President of Business Development for Trapeze Group, serving as a brand ambassador to transit industry, ensuring sea level access to their technology products and services, speaking and writing on transit trends and solutions. He also hosts the very well-known podcast Transit Unplugged, interviewing top public transportation leaders about their work, operations and transit trends. He is author of the highly recommended bestseller Future of Public Transport and a children's book on public transport from steam locomotives to Hyperloop and beyond. Welcome, Paul Comfort. Thank you. Great to be here. So thank you that you come to our show. We are living in crazy times. How was your work affected by social movement restrictions and COVID-19? So it was dramatically impacted, um, Agnes, uh, and thank you again for having me on the show. Um, so it's funny how life works. I, uh, I had this book, The Future of Public Transportation, which I'd worked on for quite a while, and it was coming out and, uh, and it was published on March 1st. And of course, a week or two after that, the COVID-19 pandemic hit here in the US. I live on the East Coast near Washington, DC. I had a whole world uh, book signing tour scheduled. I had t-shirts made up, literally, with all the places I was going around the world. I was going to Dubai and Singapore and Canada, all over America, and do book signings and speeches. All that was canceled. Uh, I had uh, I had to go virtual. But you know what? There's, I always look for the silver lining. I've actually been able to have, I think, um, even more impact right here from my home office um, outside Annapolis, Maryland, where I've been able to drop in virtually into staff meetings from Vancouver, Washington, to uh, you know Australia and many places in between, talking about the future of public transportation, not just the book, but the topic. And now that COVID has hit, uh, I've been able to, I actually started another version of the podcast called Comfort's Corner, focused primarily on the, how the COVID uh, pandemic has impacted public transit. So it's really impacted us, uh, it impacted me and our industry dramatically. But I think there's a silver lining, and that's what we'll talk about today. <laughs> that's great. Um, in the beginning, we had this little story where the daughter was uh, given the book, your book about the uh, public transport for children from the locomotive, steam locomotive, and to the very modern stuff. Uh, how did you come to the idea for a children's book? Isn't that interesting? So that was my COVID project, actually. That's what I did during the five months of the COVID lockdown was I worked on this children's book. And it, it really is a corollary to the book I just mentioned, The Future of Public Transportation. So, And that rolls back to the podcast. So when I started work for Trapeze, I, I finished up 30 years in the public transit industry as CEO of the MTA in, in Baltimore, like you mentioned. And then I went to work for this um, amazing technology company. Uh, and they've given me a lot of flexibility to really be a thought leader and to you know investigate and to research public transit best practices. And one of the things we've done is started this podcast, Transit Unplugged, where I interview CEOs of transit systems. And I have done it up until COVID in person. So almost every interview I've done has been, I go to their office you know, in Sydney, Australia. I sit down with Howard Collins, the CEO of uh, you know, Sydney Rail. We talk about 
you know, he gives me a tour of his rail operations center. We ride on the train. I meet his staff. And then we sit down and we tape the interview. And it's been fantastic, a fabulous experience. I've been able to travel the whole world for this podcast. And after about a year and a half of it, I'd interviewed, um, I don't know, 50 or 60 of these executives. I said, you know, I've really got my finger on the pulse of what's happening in this transit industry. And there's so many cool things happening, you know, from mobility as a service to autonomous vehicles to Hyperloop. I really want to, you know, capture all that information in a book and share it with people. And so I knew that I didn't have the best uh, wisdom on all of it. So I invited 40 of the world's leading experts to write for this book, The Future of Public Transportation. And then I thought, you know, my wife and I are strong believers in family and We've been married you know, 33 years now. We have six children uh, and we have five grandchildren. And I wanted to have, uh, I started thinking about, wouldn't it be fun to have a book where I could share with my grandkids um, and other children the story of public transportation and why I'm so passionate about it, how it can help so many people, how it does help so many people. So that was really the genesis of the book. And the timing was perfect. I would not have had the time to really focus on it had I been on my heavy traveling schedule. But because I was home for the last five months, I thought, you know, I want to do this. And so I started kind of writing down, sketching down, you know, ideas of what I would do. Then I put together uh, kind of a basic storyboard of what I would go back into the past, talk about how it all got started, you know, 150 years ago with the Tom Thumb Railroad, and then work our way through history, showing the different types of vehicles in a cartoon style picture book. Not a coloring book, although I did stick one picture up front that kids can color of a bus because uh, I know the kids like the color. But the rest of the book is all colored for them. And uh, and I, Agnes, I uh, crowdsourced the artwork. Literally, I you know I I knew a few artists, but I thought you know I want to get somebody who's really good at this. And so I just I have like seventeen thousand people I'm linked into on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So I put it out there. Hey, I'm going to write a kids book. Anybody interested in, in doing illustration is not going to charge me an arm and a leg for it. <laughs> and uh, and I had a couple people and I ended up with this brilliant uh, illustrator, Sudeep KP out of India. And we have spent, uh, we've had a, a Sunday morning date for the last three or four months where every Sunday morning we do a Zoom call just like you and I are doing now. And we would go, I sent him the storyboard with all the pictures I'd like him to draw. And he illustrated it on a computer. Uh, and a lot of it did right while we were on the phone together, while we were talking. He would say, okay, you want, yeah, yeah. So you got to move that kid back behind the yellow line at the train station. No kids are allowed over the yellow line. Those kind of things, you know. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and we ended up with a, with a, a brilliant storyboard. Uh, the artwork is, is sharp and crisp. Uh, and you know what else? There's nothing else on the market like it. Before the COVID-19 crisis, I went to bookstores and I looked through all the children's books. And I saw just what I noticed as a granddad, mm. which is all these books I'm sharing with my kids are monster trucks, you know, um, and all and zoo animals and that, but nothing about public transportation and the vehicles. I mean, once in a while, there's a book that has a bus in it, but not the kind of historical perspective, which is fun, giving stories, uh, anecdotes, and hopefully it'll capture their imagination, especially in this post COVID area when there's been so much negativity uh, toward public transportation. Yeah. So we could talk about that more if you'd like, but that was part of, that's kind of how it all got started. It remembered when I, you sent it to me. So of course I was reading it. It remembered me about my grandfather as my grandfather started his career as a blacksmith. And then he moved to be uh, for, to a, a locomotive steam locomotive. And then he was under the first who did the exams to use an electrical locomotive. Oh, wow. Yeah. And my mother, she is nearly 100. She told me about it, that he and his friends were learning at home for these exams and that it was very heavy work. <laughs> and when yes. I was going through your book, <laughs> I remembered these stories and that, oh, yes. Oh, yes. My grandfather, too. Okay. Interesting? I had I had the same experience as I was putting it together. I remembered my father, uh, William Comfort, Bill Comfort. He grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and he used to tell me stories about how he would ride the train, the subway train in New York out to Coney Island with just one token. Mm -hmm. So I put that in the book, how that back in the in the uh, you know 1930s and 40s, for one token, you could ride the train as far as it would go. And it was just a few cents. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really his escape out of the city into the into out to the beaches of and the fun parts of Coney Island. And so 
Public transportation, just like you mentioned, Agnes, has been so important to so many generations. I want to make sure we can share that with the next generation. Uh, is it planned that uh, maybe some transport agencies give it to school kids? I hope so. I've had um, I've had a few transit agencies, uh, their CEOs talk to me about the book. And um, I'm actually working right now with UITP, the International Transportation Association. They sent me a nice quote, and now they're going to start promoting it. And I, I think that schools, I just was on the phone earlier today uh, with a, a, a reporter for a newspaper, and she said she wanted to send it to her daughter, who was a school teacher, and, and they're doing homeschool instruction with children. And she'd like to have the digital version so she can put it on the kids' laptops and so that they can, you know, talk about it as part of their school curriculum. And so I'm, I'm really hoping and believing that that's going to take off because it really is valuable information for young people. Yes, I guess uh, the all these pupils, that they have to use it. And maybe it's nice to hand it over to say in the first day when they go to school, <laughs> here is something to understand where your school buses are coming from and where they maybe are going to. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, school buses are in the book, too, because yeah, yeah. that's really the form of mass transportation that most kids are familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you are a public transport ambassador and evangelist. Why? How did you come to this type of career? Well, thank you. I. Uh, it's funny. My uh, My father was a pastor and my uncle was actually an evangelist in the church. And so that's kind of where I got the, the name from as I thought about what did I want to do uh, at this stage of my career. And I really wanted to share back with people what I've learned over the last 30 years. I spent 30, I started in 1987, I got my bachelor's degree from University of Maryland. My first job was my county where I live, Queen Anne's County, Maryland, um, was to become the county's first transportation coordinator. We had a small van system that served the elderly and people with disabilities, took them to senior centers and doctors. And then the county commissioners asked me to start a public transportation system for the public. So I did. It was called County Ride. And we grew it. And after a few years, it won the national award as the best small community transit system in America. And that really got me um, going in my career. Worked there for seven years. And then I began working for all these big international companies uh, that now you know people have heard about. Now they're companies like First Transit and Transstaff. But I worked for all these companies that run transit service under contract for cities and help them start up systems all over America. From Microsoft, the corporation, I helped them set up their first campus shuttle system with 40 minivans so that people could pick up the phone. When they got to the front door of their building, they would there would be a minivan waiting for them and they could be transported anywhere on the two mile campus in Redmond, Washington. That was back in the 1990s. Uh, all the way to the Virgin Islands where we ran Vitran, the public transit system there. And um, I got to do a lot of traveling and speaking and learning about public transit. And I really uh, developed a passion for it. And I saw, you know, not only for me, a big part of public transportation is helping people that don't have any other way to get around. Um, and so a big part of my career was working what we call paratransit, mm -hmm. which is van service, door-to-door -door service for people with disabilities. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I spent five years running America's largest single contract for that in the Washington, D.C. area. I worked for a company called MV Transportation. I was director of operations for the system, which transported 10,000 people every day people with disabilities with, you know, about a thousand drivers and vehicles all over. And uh, my job was to manage that day to day. We had 12 garages where vans were a big call center. And I really, um, you know, my heart is to, is to help people. I'm a people person. I learned yeah. that probably from my, my father, right? He, he wanted to help people in their spiritual life. Yeah. I want to help people that as well, but also in their physical, you know, getting around where they need to go. And, uh, and people would be stuck at home yeah. or stuck in nursing homes or lawn care facilities with no mobility if we did not have these services. And so I became really passionate about it. And then our governor of Maryland, a newly elected governor, asked me to run the, the state's public transportation mm -hmm. system. And uh, I really, you know, I kind of went from a little small system with 15 vans to America's, you know, 11th largest system with 5,000 employees and, and, and contractors and a billion dollar budget. And now I wanted to take that and share that with other people. So that's why I'm so passionate about it. I really feel like it's not only a way to help, you know, the elderly and disabled folks who can't get around, but folks who need to get to employment uh, and people who need to visit mom and dad and for children to get around. I mean, especially in the urban areas of the world, public transportation is so important. Yeah. And that's not even to talk about the environmental impact because public every bus takes 40 cars off the road, all that smoke and smog out of their tailpipe. 
And now everybody's moving toward electric buses or other zero emission buses, hydrogen or CNG. It's even more clean and even more a way for us to help improve our world. Oh, wonderful and impressive and unbelievable. So you are not a trained public transport uh, person, but you are more or less went step by step from the small uh, systems to very big systems, special power transport and so on. Ah, now I understand much better your <laughs> as uh, when we now have this pandemic. I guess this was uh, unbelievable for public transport. People stayed at home. Other people had to go to work as being essential. And uh, I guess public transport is essential. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what happened uh, mid-March when, or maybe a little bit earlier, even when everything was going shelter in place and, and so on? Sure. Yeah, it was. It's a, it's a. It's been an amazing time for the public transportation industry worldwide, as you can imagine. So, um, you know, here in the U.S. and in Canada and in parts of Europe, ridership was finally on an increase in 2019 after a five to seven year lull where routes went down. People figured out how to improve ridership, and that was to reboot their bus networks, to add in frequency, add in high frequency routes meaning routes that come every 10 to 15 minutes, so you don't need a schedule, runs like a train for the buses. And then thirdly, reducing friction, which would be you know, adding bus only lanes, transit signal priority, and then moving the fare collection kind of off the vehicle, not doing so much work at the fare box. People, I, I studied it. And in 2018, seven of our systems here in the US of our biggest systems saw an increase in ridership and they all did one or more of those steps. And I went to England and talked to their folks. They were doing the same thing. Canada. So it was great. 2020, we entered on a high. We were really excited about the future of public transportation. And then all the, shut, the shutdowns came where the government agency said, you know, hey, you can't ride unless you're an essential worker. And so we had a 50 to 95 percent ridership reduction. Uh, and then, you know, we had the commensurate reduction in routes. Uh, people started moving to rear door boarding only because they didn't want drivers to have to interact with passengers and You potentially spread germs. As a result of that, people couldn't pay their fares because the fare box was at the front door. So most systems waived fares and said, you can mm -hmm. ride for free. And then they had to really ramp up their cleaning protocols. And so uh, the money was coming down, but the costs were going up because people didn't want to lay off drivers during this time uh, unless they had to, because you want to keep your employees employed. And so they found other jobs for them and the contracting companies, like I mentioned, First Transit, MV, Keolis, all those guys, They wanted to keep their drivers on board too. So they found other jobs for them to do meals on wheels delivery for the transit agencies and lots of other things. And then transit agencies started doing divider between the seats as we got through the, through the pandemic health kiosks, like my friend uh, Phil Verster is doing up in Toronto, Canada seating at buses was at a reduced capacity where they're cutting down the number of people that can sit in a bus. So there's some social distancing and then they provided real time right now. They're providing real time information for passengers. I just did a whole podcast episode with David Gerstel, the chief digital officer of Boston's transit system, where they're now putting this right on the phone. So you can see, hey, the bus coming is full. And over the last three days, it's been full at this bus stop. So maybe I need to try a micro transit vehicle. Then they've added in ultraviolet light and micro transit and mass on board. And I think there's going to be long term implications of this. I think that we're going to move away from the fare box like London has done. where They don't really accept cash anymore. A lot of transit systems are considering that. Moving toward door boarding. I think our commuter services are really going to recover slowly. The buses and the trains that bring people in from outside of the city into the city. Mm -hmm. And of course, the cleaning protocols really have to be continue to be ramped up. Uh, that needed a lot of flexibility. Uh, could, the, right. could the public transport organizations don't have a, a reputation for be extremely flexible? <laughs> You are exactly <laughs> right, Ag. Hit it on the head. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this this needed flexible responses. How did they manage? It did, and and uh, it's a very good point. I've actually written an article that that I'll give uh, a link to you after this that we can share with folks. That I've when I've talked to the folks that were flexible and I've studied it and talked to professors and uh, a lot of leaders and I've come up with actually the 10 top ways to future proof your transit service. And uh, a lot of it involves that flexibility because what happened was when the routes had to be adjusted downward, 
most transit agencies have employment contracts and they have uh, collective bargaining agreements with unions. And there's lots of work rules in them. And unless you have them uploaded into your software system, when you change routes, you have to go through a big process to have labor relations departments comb through them and looking for how when you, you take the routes and you put them in the blocks of work for drivers and you really need to have the right software so you can reroute service, adjust rosters quickly and seamlessly. Um, and so, and then, you know, the other thing is a lot of transit systems have technology that's stuck in the 1980s and 90s still. They're not even tracking their assets. Agnes, just before this pandemic, I was in uh, a big city in Canada and I was touring their operations and I saw up on the wall a piece of paper in, in their dispatch office. And it was um, a map of their yard where all the buses were parked. And in it, it had the parking spots on it. And then it had handwritten, the bus number 22 is parked here. Bus number 67 is there. 101's here. And every few hours, they have somebody walk the lot to see where the buses are parked. That is so oh, no. uh, old technology. I mean, that's what I was doing when I started in the 1980s. There's software now and hardware available for buses, and you need to have it on your yeah. vehicle. You can track your bus wherever yeah. it's at. I mean, they're bringing buses back to the yard to clean it in between runs now because of the pandemic, especially the smaller vans, people with disabilities. You've got to know where your vehicles are. You've got to be able to communicate with them, not just with radio signals, but with cellular signals, you know, all this new technology. And so that's really the, the way that people are trying to harden or future proof their transit system. They've learned a lesson during the pandemic. And we know that something else like this could happen. Right. And so we need to be ready to be more flexible for the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, but some, uh, I, of course, listen to episodes of uh, Comfort's Corner, <laughs> uh, <laughs> seem to have uh, said, okay, that freed us up uh, to do things we hadn't thought to, uh, that we kept, were able to do it. That's right. One example would be, um, I talked to a CEO of a transit system and she said, Paul, I've been wanting to do away with paper route schedules for a long time. And it takes, you know, six to nine months to go through a public process, announcements, hearings, people that rely on, but she just wanted to go to online and not have to change, print all new schedules every time they adjusted a route. So she was able to do it under the emergency situation mm -hmm. of COVID. Another CEO in California told me she was able to make dramatic route adjustments that she'd been wanting to make that she felt would serve people better. And through the COVID crisis, you know, the, uh, The Chinese character for crisis turned upside down is opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so she took the crisis and turned it to an opportunity and was able to adjust the routes in a way where the riders would be able to use it uh, more flexibly. And so, uh, so yeah, so there's opportunities here as well. And people are using this opportunity to really reevaluate what they're doing. So what I found in Baltimore, when I got there, I found out that there really hadn't been significant changes to the system in 50 years. For 50 years, you've been on the same routes. You know, you were talking about how you're, Your grandfather, you know, went from the trains to the electric vehicles. So Baltimore had the same thing. And back 50, 60 years ago, they had these electric trolleys uh, that would go downtown. And that's where all the action was, right? So everybody wanted to go downtown, like the song, downtown. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but now in, you know, in the 20 teens and 2020, that's not where all the action is anymore. Now there's jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs around the city. Yeah. But the bus routes have never been reconfigured in a dramatic way, you know, all at once. To make that happen and so this is an opportunity and i hopefully we'll have a chance to talk about it mm -hmm. for transit systems to really evaluate what are we doing uh do we need to move toward a mobility on demand model where maybe we cut back some of the routes that weren't productive but we don't want to leave those people stranded so maybe we do a contract with uber or lyft or the micro transit providers in the area or maybe we start our own service like my friend robbie mackinnon did in kansas city where he started something called ride kc freedom And first it was vans just for people with disabilities. And then he said, I'm going to open it up to everybody. You just call in or you go on your app and you book a trip. People without a disability pay a little bit more to subsidize the trip mm -hmm. for people with disabilities. And everyone gets door-to-door -door service. And so these type of new models right now, while we're in this pandemic still, and in Europe, you know, they're having another resurgence mm -hmm. of it, as you know. Uh, it, it, now's the time to take a look and say, what can we do with technology to really improve what we're offering? We don't want to sell what people aren't buying anymore. Mm -hmm. We want to provide them a service which really meets their needs. And so whether it's e-faring, you know, moving to bracelets and necklaces and cards and phones, where you can pay your fare with that so you don't have to pay cash, to microtransit, to real-time passenger information, to federal governments finally stepping up and funding public transit like the essential service that it is. Um, so many governments like Canada only provided capital dollars up until this year. Mm -hmm. And finally this year they said, you know what, we understand now 
we see that our economy cannot function without effective mobility for the essential workers. And so we're going to go ahead and start matching whatever the local province does. We can match up to a cap with federal dollars. So I'm really excited to see the national governments, like in the U.S., we did the same thing. We stepped up in a big way and gave COVID funding relief to them, which is now running out and they need more. Uh, but it's happening all over the world. That's not just a local or city responsibility anymore, but the federal governments realize for our cities to function, we have to have effective mass transit. Um, what about uh, the users, uh, the people using public transport? Are they coming back? You talked about commuters, maybe not so much coming back. Yes. What's the situation now? And do you think you can catch up with this trend that more people were using public transport in 2019? Excellent question. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a complicated answer and it's based on where you're at, right? So, um, uh, for example, I was on, a, I was on a, um, a live webinar about a month ago and one of the members on the webinar was the CEO of the transit system in Lagos, Nigeria. She has 11 million people that she that that are in the re, in the region. She said, Paul, we shut our service down completely during the peak of the pandemic. And when we open back up. We're back to 95 percent ridership within a month. And she said the reason is because the folks who ride our transit system, a lot of them are don't have any other option. They're day laborers. They need to get to work. And so our transit system is, you know, is is rapidly recovering ridership. You go to another type of service, what I called commuter services. So let's go to Long Island Railroad. Right or my service that I used to run called Mark, the commuter train service, which took people into Washington, D.C. Uh, or in Toronto, coming back much slower. It's more analogous to what happened after 9-11 um, here in America when people were afraid to fly airplanes for a while. I went back and looked at the National Transportation Statistics Ridership Database, and it took 18 months for riders to come back and feel comfortable to ride airplanes after they saw one crash into the World Trade Center. And so uh, I think that's going to be similar on these commuter services Because in addition to people being a little more concerned to ride on a train for an hour into the city, even with a divider, even with a mask, the other thing is, you know, the working situation has changed. Now people realize, hey, I don't have to go into work every day. I can actually do this from home. I've actually been pretty productive. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of professionals who don't maybe aren't going to go into those tall buildings downtown anymore, but maybe only twice a week. And so they were the main folks that were riding these commuter services. Uh, so what I've heard from some CEOs is that they now – talking to one in, in uh, Sydney, Australia the other day, they're looking at, you know, the, the peaks in the morning and the afternoon, people were riding into and out of the city. They've been flattened a little bit. So instead now they're going to say, you know what, what do people want? We still, they still need to service. Let's start nights and weekends. So people can go into the entertainment things that are in the city, the ball games, uh, the nightlife and still have a safe ride home and then maybe get a lift or something or an Uber ride home or a taxi ride home at the train station. So they don't have to drive if they've had something to drink. So now we're, we're, we're going to see, I think, new types of uh, routes and services pop up to replace it. This micro transit mobility on demand. Um, but in the, in the center part of cities, I think public transportation will still be vital and will still be utilized. And I just looked at numbers yesterday from UITP looking at ridership trends at major cities across the world from Vienna to all the and it definitely is creeping up. Not as fast as we would like, uh, but it is creeping up five, 10 percent a month moving up, moving up, moving up. We were down to about 50% in most cities. They got down to about 50% ridership. Now a lot of cities are around 70%. And okay. so they're eking back up. The question oh, yes. is the last 20%, I just talked to a CEO last week. You said, my question, he says, is after we get to 80%, what's going to happen to that last 20? And I think that's yet to be answered. So you think it will take maybe a year, half a year, uh, one and a half year, till it's forgotten, especially as here in Europe, we are expecting a tough month ahead. We have quite increasing numbers again and second wave and whatever, what will of course harm uh, public transport. I guess in London, it's yeah. now U some sort of U-turn that people is uh, or, uh, again asked to stay at home and not to go back to yeah. the downtown. Uh, so I just did that yesterday, the prime minister is announcing stuff. So yeah, you know, it's, um, It's a shame that, in my opinion, we've had a lot of political leaders really um, cast blame on public transportation as at the beginning, saying, you know, you shouldn't ride public transit. It's a, co you know, it's a petri dish for COVID. Well, that hasn't proved to be true. 
Uh, the studies that have come out haven't shown people are catching any more on a bus than they are in a grocery store or even less so than at parties mm-hmm. at their own home. And so now I think the, the damage has been done. People are a little bit afraid. And so public transit agencies are having to do what they call the theater of, of the clean. And so they're having cleaners come out and wipe down the poles on the bus while people are on it to kind of show them, hey, we are doing a good job here. Or they're you know making a big deal out of the yeah. fact like New York City Metro now is using those um, those lights which flash and mm. which will um, clean the vehicle at night. Um, so there's lots of ways where we're trying to kind of send the message, hey, it's okay. And that's really what my children's book is about. Mm. It's about telling children you know, it's safe and it's clean and it's exciting mm-hmm. to ride public transit. You know, obviously we need to take safety precautions, right? Mm-hmm. And follow what the science tells us. Um, but public transit is still an effective, safe and clean way, especially environmentally, mm-hmm. to be able to meet your mobility needs. And it's cheaper than buying a car by far. <laughs> In any case, when you just talk about the environment side of public transport, yes. What about uh, new ways of uh, new engines, electricity, uh, fuel cells? Uh, will we see this in the near future or just in the 10 to 20 year future? Yeah, that's what's one of the things, um, Agnes, that I find very exciting about public transportation is that how the new technology really over the last five or 10 years, Public transportation has had more new technology come in than almost any other field outside of medicine, from uh, zero emission buses, which we'll talk about more in a minute, to Hyperloop, which is, you know, fantastical science fiction things that are coming true, where Elon Musk and Sir Richard Branson are in a race to get the first, you know, tube where a train can go on electric, electric train can go on tracks and you pull all the air out of it. So it's like you're in outer space, not in the car, but in the tube. So there's no friction. And that that thing can fly up to, in theory, subsonic speeds. Right now, they're testing in Las Vegas. They've invited me to come tour it the next time I can travel, where they're getting up close to you know 280, 290 miles per hour, whatever that is in kilometers. Uh, so they're getting there. Fast. And, um, it's fast. There's all, yeah, there's all this new technology. And guess what? It's right here at our door. Um, even the vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, which is the last picture in my children's book, I was able to last November – Um, moderate a panel for the state of Nevada. They did what's called Go Nevada, which is a one-day panel on all the future. And I moderated a panel on uh, the future of transportation. It included people with uh, unmanned drones, with Uber Air, which is these basically like a helicopter, but not quite like an Osprey helicopter. Have you ever seen those in the military? And it's a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle. So the, it lifts you up and then it goes back, the propellers do, and it shoots you forward like an airplane. And they're already doing it. I mean, they have these in places and they're testing them this year around the world. So it's so exciting. The technology is here. Just this week, a major bus manufacturer, Proterra, announced brand new batteries that can run your bus virtually all day with one charge. And so part of the problem that people had about running electric buses in the past, they're they're batteries. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have a lot of batteries in the bus. Exactly. And they would have to get trickle feed or, you know, at the end of the line, you'd have to get an extra charge. Not so much anymore. The new vehicles, you can run just as long, basically, as you can the old diesel engines, which are a lot dirtier. Even clean diesel is not nearly mm. as clean <laughs> as the as the electric battery-powered yeah. buses. And and uh, my friend Lauren Skyver has been working on hydrogen vehicles in Coachella Valley, as I mentioned earlier. And then CNG, compressed natural gas, places like Dallas and in Canada, where there's a lot of supply of that, that's zero emissions. Mm. Uh, and so... This is where the future is, and it's right here, right now. And transit systems across the world are adopting uh, the move toward electric vehicles for policy reasons as well as for environmental reasons. Uh, is there a, a funding for this switch from diesel to electricity to cell fuel to gas? Uh... Right. Yeah, most uh, a lot of uh, government agencies are actually providing extra money for people who go clean. But even so, the price of these electric vehicles are coming down, just like any new technology does, once it gets adopted closer and closer. And the lifetime cycle of operating an electric bus has been shown to actually be less than uh, that of a diesel bus because, and there's a couple podcasts if you want to hear more details on the Transit Unplugged show, just look for the ones with electric vehicles on the cover. I've done some innovation shows recently uh, where it shows that the lifetime cycle cost of the bus, because maintenance is so much less, you don't have that big 
internal combustion engine to maintain. It's just a few parts, an electric bus. And the cost to operate it for how many miles it can travel on a charge is less than gas. Uh, and then the actual purchase price of the vehicles are coming down closer into the range of, you know, big, big buses are like $600,000 now, a regular diesel bus. And so an electric bus might be another hundred or 200,000 uh, up front, but then you quickly recoup that cost by the operating cost. Come, and now even those initial purchase prices are coming down. Uh, in your podcast, you mentioned that there will be a large funding and spending program in U.S., for public transport in these uh, Corona recovery measure package. Can yes. this be used for making a public transport more sustainable? Yes, it can. That's a great question. Uh, the, um, the United States Congress passed what was called the CARES Act a couple months ago, and it provided $25 billion in U.S. transit funding. That's the largest single pot of money ever given by the federal government to transit. It represented 280% of the funds that we had already received for fiscal year 2020. And they're talking about additional funds being made available in, a, in one more stimulus COVID package. Um, and uh, yes, they're allowing those funds to be used for operating costs and also capital costs related to recovering from COVID. When we think about 2023, name of our podcast, there you go. What would be, as an industry expert, your uh, resume? What will we see in 2023, like 2019? And where would you expect from your expertise that we see changes? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, and it, it's really addressed in my book, The Future of Public Transportation, and even in the children's book, both of which are on Amazon now. Uh, and that is basically, we're going to have a different world when we come out of COVID, generally and specifically in public transit. As I mentioned earlier, I think that we are going to be moving to contactless faring, moving away from traditional fare boxes mm -hmm. like Transport for London has already done, and emphasizing e-faring, wearables, contactless cards, which speed boarding, I think there's going to be a lot more information in the hands of riders. Uh, people are going to be able to book their trips online without having to call in to pack call centers. I used to run a call center with 60 reservations sitting right next to each other. That's not so uh, doable right now because of COVID. And so adding in more technology, whether it's mobile trip booking, whether it's new software to run the back office of your system, that's what's happening. And the other big trend is the micro transit trend which is you know, either autonomous vehicles, which we haven't talked a lot about today, but using these vehicles without drivers, mobility as a service, moving things more personalized. Uh, a friend of mine, Mark Joseph, uh, who was head of a company called Transdev, used to say, we want personalized, autonomous, um, connected, and electric. Uh, and so did his, uh, his successor also said that, Jan LaRiche, who headed up Transdev. That was their big pace, you know, personalized, autonomous, connected, meaning it's all connected mm -hmm. together, and electric. And I really believe in that in that mantra that I think that's where we're headed. And I think in 2023, we're going to see a lot more of that. We'll see a lower touch environment, higher personalization, uh, and really more connectivity between all the modes of mobility in a city. So the public transit system, the traditional buses and trams and light rail and subways will be more connected through your phone mm -hmm. to the lifts of the company to, of the world, to whatever Uber turns into, to taxi cabs, to ferries, to e-bikes, to e-scooters, all the different types of mobility will all be available and connected. You'll be able to kind of plan your trip on your phone. You'll be able to pay for it and potentially even subscribe to it like they do right now in Helsinki with the WIM app where you can subscribe and maybe for $500 a month, you can get unlimited transit and a set number of trips on a zip rental car or, or on a lift vehicle. And it really provides you as a family where you don't, in America, you know, everybody has two cars, you know, it's just, it's yeah. just the way it is. But if we move to this model, we can really get away with just one car to be practical. If you live in an urban area, you could use this app for, you know, the average cost of the car, they say is about 950 US dollars a month. Uh, that's with maintenance, fuel and payments and insurance. And it might even be more than that for some people, depending on the car you get. But now with maybe a $500 a month subscription, you could get anywhere you need to in the region. And so why would you pay that double payment for a car when you don't really need it? And it would give you much more flexibility. You don't have to drive. You can sit and ride and look at your phone and read the newspaper. Yeah. So it's hear, even more hear fun. your podcast. Hear your podcast. 
<laughs> yeah, we have similar initiatives here in Europe. Maybe uh, it's called a 365 euro uh, ticket, meaning that you can use uh, the area in a, in a metropolitan area. You can use everything of public transport for one year. So one euro, oh, well, one day. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In any case, so and as you say, uh, it doesn't make sense to run a car when you have such, such a po uh, possibility uh, from public transport. As long as there is what's called last mile solutions. Mm -hmm. So the last mile solution is, you know, how do I get to and from the train station or the bus stop? If it's not right in front of my house, I can't walk 10 blocks every day to get there. So transit systems need to make sure that they integrate with the other providers that are available, either start their own, like I said, or do connections with taxi cabs or other micro transit providers to make sure you can get from your front door to the main mass transit system. That's a key. And I think that's what people are working on right now during COVID is how do I make that connection? Uh, and so what do you think about reputation? Will we see in 2023, uh, elevated reputation of public transport, understanding better how important it is for our cities and our society to have a good public transport? I do. Yeah. I really believe that, uh, you know, public transit took a black eye during COVID because of inaccurate predictions by politicians who, who were, had knee jerk reactions to what was happening. I'm, I'm a former politician myself. I'm an, I was a former elected official. So I can say that I'm one of the family <laughs> and I can say that, uh, you know, politicians oftentimes want to point the, the, the finger of blame to someone. And uh, it's time now to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Uh, those things did, you know, Hey, we'll, we'll give them a break, right? They were doing what they thought was best at the moment, but now in retrospect and with the studies, we need them out front helping to rebuild our reputation. And then if we provide a better service, a more personalized, autonomous, connected electric service, I think that we will regain the reputation and actually um, improve it by, by providing a better uh, service to the individual. Uh, we started with your dramatic experience of seeing canceled your world tour for the wonderful book, uh, Future of Public Transport. Uh, are there uh, things you changed during uh, the COVID restrictions where you say, okay, that I will keep till 2023? Yeah, you know, that's good. You know, what, what have we learned, right, to improve our lives? Well, um, I've been trying to eat better. <laughs> uh, you know, I, during my travels, you know, you eat out all the time, right? Yeah. And so uh, sometimes you're, you're eating too many desserts and, uh, you know, too many cappuccinos or whatever. And, uh, and so eating more at home with a good home cooked meals, I think is maybe a little healthier, I hope. And I hope to keep that up going forward. And I also... Um, also time with the family, right? It's important to take time with the family. And I've really started my own kind of morning routine, which I didn't always have. So I get up and do have some personal reflection time, some devotion time, read a book that I like before I go to bed instead of watch TV. I hope to keep all these trends up. And will you write more children books? I hope so. <laughs> I, I know I plan to write more books. I've got an idea to write a book. My father passed away. We were talking about our fathers and grandfathers. My father passed away uh, last you know, last decade. And uh, I've thought a lot about the, the meaning of having been a father myself and talk. And a lot of my friends are fathers. And I'm going to write a book, I think, called Without Our Fathers. And it's going to be the impact of fathers on our lives as men and women. Uh, and also, you know, when they were here and also what impact do they continue to have even when they're gone? As we try to live up to their legacies or to be honest with you, a lot of men have what I call daddy issues where mm -hmm. they're still trying to earn their father's, you know, um, you know, approval, even mm -hmm. when their father's passed away. And how can we, <laughs> as men and women, you know, kind of free ourselves from bondage to the past, but also fulfill our highest destiny and um, as as parents for our children and to make sure that our children uh, understand the, their role going forward. So I'm excited about that, uh, that possibility, kind of branching out of transportation a little bit. I've written three books now, and maybe my next one will be a little bit more just in the general leadership role. I just <laughs> took a position with George Washington University mm -hmm. as an advisor to their leadership program, and I hope to do more leadership speaking mm -hmm. and, and uh, or thinking on that topic as well. Oh, that sounds really great. Paul, it was so great to talk to you, to feel the energy 
<laughs> and the drive you bring with you. And uh, as you said, let's put together some of your resources for our listeners. And thank you very, very much for sharing this time, for sharing your thoughts. And um, go, uh, go ahead and evangelize for the public transport, Paul. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I just want to mention to folks, this, this children's book has really become a labor of love for me. And so I've decided to basically give it away at cost. So uh, I've priced it as low as I can on Amazon. They won't let me go any lower than two dollars and ninety-five cents because that's, I guess, their cost to for the ebook. So the ebook is available now. You can download it on your Kindle. It'll be dropped on or your laptop on October first. And the paperback is going to be priced. This is U.S. dollars. I don't know what it'll be in Europe. Uh, they do that translation, but the lowest they would let me go is nine fifty. So I'm selling for nine ninety-five U.S. dollars. Again, so I'll make forty-five cents a book if that. But I wanted to get it in the hands of children. And so I tried to lower the price as much as I possibly could because I really believe it'll be good for our children to learn about public transportation. And thank you. And I will continue to evangelize. And you're helping me do that through your podcast. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.